Fools and Douglas Murray. Flavia called you a populist. Would you agree? It just shows how um, very unaware she is of almost anything. Oh boy, have we got a good one for you today, guys. We're going to be watching Douglas Murray using verbal ninja prowess of the highest caliber to tear strips off a woke activist. Douglas comes into this debate with his usual classy and amicable attitude until, for some reason, his opponent Flavia decides to poke the bear. So hold on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen, and let's get into the clips. In order to, to come to, to an understanding of your idea of Europe as a place, I, I also quote you, uh, by the end of the lifespans of most people currently alive in Europe, Europe will not be Europe, and the peoples mm -hmm. of Europe will have lost, you wrote. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, they will have lost the only place in the world we had to call home. Mm. What does this home where you speak about look like, and, and, or, or looked like? And why is it in danger, exactly? Who is the danger? Well, this is a very, very complex matter, as you know, which I write about in considerable length and depth. There's a lot of historic history to go through, a lot of philosophy to go through, and a lot of recent facts and, and uh, events. Uh, I suggest it's, it's quite obvious that, for instance, uh, in the last census, I'm, I'm talking here about the UK because it's the country I know best. I know your country fairly well, but let me give you another statistic from the UK. In the UK, in the last census, which the government does every 10 years, it turned out that people who identified as white British, that is, uh, uh, people who we would have described as British a couple of generations ago, and this isn't to say that people can't become British, of course, but uh, the census a couple of uh, years ago said that people who identified as white British were a minority in uh, 23 out of the 33 boroughs in London. Now, if you were born in the uh, 1960s, say, which isn't that long ago, uh, uh, this means a total transformation of the capital city of the country you're in. Now, I suggest that uh, uh, some people deprecate that, some people love it. Most people have a very mixed view towards it. But to pretend that it isn't a, a very significant change to occur in a lifetime is nonsensical. Uh, I suggest that if we solve this sort of problem, it'll be done not by pretending that it's invented by, you know, crazy theorists or something, but by recognizing that there are a set of competing problems that we face, a set of competing virtues is what I describe it as in the Aristotelian sense a set of competing virtues, which in the case of Europe in the 21st century, are a competition between justice and mercy. That is, we wish to have justice uh, um, for people coming, we should have mercy to people fleeing uh, other places, but we also need to have a sense of justice for people in Europe who pay their taxes, who have um, been decent citizens and, and need to be asked if there are going to be massive societal changes that will take place. Because we're not Petri dishes, we are... We are so very reasonable and fair points there, and he's speaking for a large portion of the European population when he asks these questions. And they're not easy questions to ask, but they're the questions that are on everybody's lips in a rapidly changing European demographic. But then, from the other side of the aisle, his opponent Flavia comes in, and in her ignorant haze, in a seemingly inebriated stupor, she picks a fight that she thought that she was ready for. But no. Oh, no, 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 Flavia. You weren't ready. No! She, she wasn't ready! And these remarks are painful to listen to for anybody that has so much of a slither of understanding of how the world works. But I implore you to pay attention and listen carefully to what she is saying, because Douglas Murray absolutely rips it apart. I want to drink Vino Verde in Lisbon. I want to go there by night train, wearing a leopard patterned pyjama in a compartment full of strangers. I want to have oranges for breakfast and know exactly where they come from. And there's only one place in the world where you have the freedom and the possibility to do this, and that's Europe. Because Europe stands for freedom, Europe stands for opportunities and possibilities. But it also stands for dignity, decency and respect. Europe learns the hard way, not once, but twice. Only fools and Douglas Murray would give up these lessons learned. Fools and Douglas Murray. You done messed up, A.A. Ron! Every populist movement has at its center the goal of destroying these institutions. Even though they are often democratically elected, which shows the liberal nature of the democratic system, once in power, 
they have only one goal, to deconstruct liberal institutions. Right-wing populists like Douglas Murray attack these institutions because they want arbitrariness, they want chaos, they want the rule of law not to be the strongest but to be the fittest who survives. Because they are part of that small elite, the privileged few. As soon as they get the power, they expose their fundamental illiberal views. They function like a Trojan horse or an evil uncle who arrives with a bouquet of flowers and leaves with the only ways you've had. The right-wing populist arguments are outdated and, frankly speaking, very boring. They do nothing for actually solving problems, such as challenges of climate change. They're not only distracting us, they're wasting our time, and they don't even show up in person. So she starts off her speech with some of the most egregious examples of basic virtue signaling platitudes of nothingness that you could ever hear. I just want to take a night train to Lisbon and have oranges for breakfast in my pajamas, but the big mean right-wing populist won't let me. And I really can't stand these speeches because you're not saying anything of substance whatsoever. You're just saying hope and fairness and diversity is our strength without getting into any of the nitty gritty, which Douglas Murray does such a fine job of. And then she goes on to insult Douglas Murray and call him a fool and try and paint him as some modern day incarnation of Benito Mussolini, an authoritarian that seeks to somehow dismantle liberal institutions. Douglas Murray is an author and a journalist with brass balls and a necessary skepticism for absolutely everything. He has an infallible eye for bullshit and a wealth of real world, boots on the ground knowledge, FYI. And then, hilariously, she goes on to say that the right wing populists were actually democratically elected. Wait, you mean the peasants actually exercised their democratic rights and voted these people in? Is this some sort of peasant joke that I'm too rich to understand? No, no. They must be stopped. You mean that populations that are having the very fabric of their countries torn apart by wars and stupid sanctions and energy and food shortages and rampant inflation and a refugee crisis aren't worried about tackling climate change? These damn peasants. Honestly, why can't we all just catch a night train to Lisbon together and eat oranges for breakfast and join hands and sing Bill Withers' Lean On Me in perfect harmony? But the most unfortunate part of that whole speech was the sudden case of rapid onset amnesia that she suffered, because she must have forgot who was on the other side of that Skype call. A 10th Dan black belt in the ancient art of verbal kung fu, a grandmaster of the linguistic Aikido, he is Bruce Lee in The Way of the Dragon. Get him! Different conclusions on, on the current state of affairs in Europe. Um, is there anything, for starters, in Flavio's speech that you would agree with? There Surprising wasn't very much in it. Um, what I mainly got was an I want list, uh, followed by a set of claims and rather presumptuous insults. Uh, it was hard to find any meat there at all uh, on the bone. Uh, that might be because it's rather hard to find any work that Flavia has done other than a tiny campaign in a tiny country. By contrast, of course, it's obviously very much the case that she's read and absorbed everything I've written, which is why she's so happy to be so insulting when she meets me almost in person. Um, so, no, there wasn't very much to pick up on other than the rather ill spoken, ill-lettered and rude attempts to attack me. Um, and I'm sorry about that because I think that it demonstrates her own personal failing as much as it does a failing of the cause that she would like to lead before she got tired and decided to get out. And that is to say this, it's a shame that people like her refuse to engage on any of the important terrain. So much uh, of my time in recent years has been spent engaging with serious actors, with serious reputations, not people like Flavia, people who have spent their life working on these issues and have made very success successful political careers, for instance, from doing so. Uh, they, uh, I've always noticed, wish to engage on the serious terrain. 
When I speak with uh, um, leading politicians across Europe, who I happen to disagree with, uh, I find that the most important and impressive ones do not get up and read bucket lists of what they'd like to do and then insult people. I find that they try to, for instance, understand what other people are thinking and particularly try to understand what the public might be thinking. For instance, they might try to work out whether the public is sometimes trying to tell them something and whether the public who they disagree with might not, in fact, be on to something on occasion. After all, it's very easy to draw rather comfortable lines around yourself and your own ideology such as it is and declare that everyone on the other side of it is, for instance, an evil populist or, or a, what was it, a fool. That's right, a fool. What an amazing way to speak about somebody else to their virtual face. And what an extraordinary way to speak about majority population votes in our continent. I see very little likelihood of anyone like Flavia, for as long as she remains in the public eye, being able to achieve anything much because she keeps dismissing the public and the public tend not to like that. Flavia, your opportunity to respond to that. Let's, let's take up on this last phrase, the public. Right, I can only say- Are you reaching them? I'd say so. I went uh, seven times against right-wing populists with big majorities. I don't have more to add. No. Holy smokes, ladies and gentlemen, that is about the greatest takedown of a woke virtue signaling leftist that you are ever likely to see. And actually, it's not over yet. Many of you will remember that Christopher Hitchens used to do these incredible verbal smackdowns where he would absolutely eviscerate his opponent without even getting out of second gear. Pure rhetorical genius that would cut straight to the heart of his opponent whilst also managing to stay quite graceful and sophisticated at the same time. These smackdowns were labeled as hitch slaps, and Douglas Murray is the only other person that I've ever seen be able to do this to quite the same effect. And she had absolutely nothing. Why would you come out swinging at somebody who is a grand master in the way of the dragon when all you know how to say is right-wing populist bad? And you might be wondering, what is a right-wing populist? And populism is a complicated one and has a broad range of meanings. But in the modern day, the way that I'd interpret is when a population rises up to democratically challenge an elite establishment group that they don't feel are serving them. This can be seen by the Brexit movement, where the people didn't want to be given orders from some unelected European Union bureaucrats in Belgium. Trump's MAGA movement that appealed to people who felt as though the coastal elites don't give a shit about the people in middle America and other places. Italy electing Georgia Maloney, who seeks to rejuvenate a demoralized Italy with traditional values such as faith in God, the traditional family and love of country, and also the Dutch farmer citizen movement, which has been making waves in Holland recently because they don't want to be told that they can't use the fertilizers that they've been using for generations in the name of climate change by some fart-sniffing globalist elitists in Davos. And there are many more, especially concentrated in Europe at the moment, that are challenging the liberal world order. But back to the debate now, and it's not over for poor Flavia. In fact, the lesson has just begun. All right, let, let's, let's see if we can get some somewhere with the two of you. Um, Flavia has argued, I would say, uh, as I listened uh, to her, that the best starting point for a European identity would be the liberal institutions. Uh, Douglas, what would be your starting point for a European identity? Well, you have to start at a much more fundamental and deeper level than that. Uh, um, Does it get you, any you... more fundamental and deep? I wonder. Uh, yes, of course. I think it gets a lot, a lot deeper. Uh, before you get institutions, you have to have the ideas and the philosophy that produce such institutions. Institutions do not just land like food parcels in countries. I agree. Yeah, so they so come the from somewhere. So, so, clearly, so clearly there is a deeper level, despite your attempt just now to pretend there isn't. Clearly there is, so we could agree on that. So the deeper level is, where do the institutions come from? Where are the ideas that the institutions come from? Now, I would say that in the case of Europe, there is a very deep set of ideas which, are, um, which you can draw out with some understanding across the continent and are best see, seen when you, when you look at the continent from anywhere else. Uh, I, th I think to some extent, uh, Flavia's ignorance of my thought is is betrayed by the fact she seems to think I'm, among other things, some weird 
right-wing populist nationalist. Again, she's a, clearly uh, um, engaged with none of my work. But one thing I've repeatedly said is that there is clearly such a thing as a European identity because you know it so clearly when you're not in Europe. Um, I've spent a lot of my life traveling all around the world, and as I write in one recent book, there's nothing that makes you feel so close to Europe or so clear about what it means than, for instance, if you're standing in China, uh, as I've done many times. Uh, there, you see that there are specific philosophical and cultural inheritances that have made Europe what it is, including the liberalism which uh, Flavia abuses or throws around like one of her confetti words, and I think doesn't quite understand. Um, but, uh, but liberalism in the truest sense in Europe is a distinctly European idea. It's an idea that Europe also gifted in this form to America, uh, uh, which, which there's a lot more to be said about. But yes, uh, European uh, philosophies and currents of ideas come from a very deep, deep and long established set of wells. Just a quick announcement before we get into the next clip, guys. Only 13.5% of you who are watching this video are actually subscribed to the channel, and it actually makes me feel personally victimized. And if you're watching this video and haven't liked and subbed, then you're actually contributing to the systemic oppression that I face every single day from straight white males in the patriarchy. And I would appreciate it if you could from now on affirm my identity as liked slash subbed. Yeah, to, to respond to what you've just said, Flavio. What is important to me is how I see these institutions, which is precisely that they are kind of the essence of values which we share here in Europe, uh, which, you know, have been um, consolidated in these institutions. Mm -hmm. And that's why I also think they are so strong and they're so relevant, and we should refer to them and see them as this set of values. They still are, but now found in um, rule of law and, and a set up of laws. Um, so. That's what I think is so important about this uh, whole idea of institutions, because it's precisely nothing that is uh, politicized that much. The only experience I made, also in Switzerland practically, is that the right-wing populists, they really attack these institutions. Can you give um, examples can your yeah. what, what to make it a bit more concrete, maybe, yeah. for Douglas? So, for, yeah. exa for example, there was this one law, uh, the right-wing populists wanted to expel criminal foreigners for even minor offenses of law, like driving mm. two times too fast within 10 years, which can happen to anybody uh, living in a country, right? So uh, the writing populists, they wanted to also exclude any clause of personal hardship. So for example, and you must know in Switzerland, 25% of the inhabitants of the country, uh, they don't have a Swiss passport, mm. but most of them, they have lived in the second or third generation in our country. So they don't really, really have any ties to where they have their nationality from, but still they would have been expelled out of the country for even minor infrictions of law. Douglas, yes, you have the word. Very quickly, by the way, I was very interested just before coming and joining you, albeit then to be insulted for not joining you by Flavia, uh, uh, that um, uh, I just noticed on the way in that there'd just been a, uh, there was a fatal stabbing, as I'm sure you know, Flavia, in Switzerland last Saturday. And the man who just confessed said he did so in the name of According to Swiss uh, public radio, this isn't uh, according to some weird anti, uh, weird populist movement. But Swiss public radio just said before we came on that he's just uh, that he is a Turkish-Swiss dual national, and that he'd been re released from prison in July before murdering somebody in Switzerland last weekend, uh, and that actually he'd been on their radar since 2017. Why, why don't you, when you mention things like you just mentioned, concede that there are some serious concerns that people have, such as, for instance, somebody being stabbed to death last Saturday, and that your, pre your presentation of all such concerns as merely being yet more of these right-wing populist concerns, actually just might be people who are anti-stabbing, for instance, and, and, and you remain totally incapable of giving an answer to such people. But the real problem is this. You were asked a very specific question. Then you went on a ramble about a specific Swiss thing. Uh, that wasn't the question you were asked. You were asked to provide some meat to the question of what you're talking about when you're talking endlessly about institutions. Which institutions are you talking about, you were asked, and you didn't answer. You started talking about a Swiss campaign. I come back to it. What are the institutions? All I say is what should be at the center of a political order and the interest is to me the individual freedom. Before you called yourself a liberal, as I understood you right, 
Um, and I don't, I don't call myself anything. I'm not okay. going to have you call me whatever you want, so awesome. you can go ahead. Flavia, I called you a populist. Would you agree? No, I mean, it just shows how um, very unaware she is of almost anything, as far as I can tell. Perhaps this is I why there's, no, the... there's, there's, no, there's no body of work that Flavia has produced, clearly, because she doesn't do her yes. research. The... I don't think I've ever been, been reasonably described as a populist. Sorry, I... Um, and I and I would add one other thing, which is that I don't uh, use the term myself because I think it's a, a term used by people who are flabby in their thinking, like Flavia. Sure. Uh, I mean, one of the most important educational tools, I'm sure you know, to try to encourage young people to engage in democratic debate is for them to see that their um, uh, opponents or their debaters are not evil people who deliberately wish to pursue wicked ideas, but are fellow citizens whose concerns need to be listened to and perhaps even acted upon. What I'm interested in is it, it, whether you see the conundrum that faces you when you describe people as right-wing populists, and again, I would quite like a, a definition of what you mean by populist, because it's a, a word that I don't use myself because I think it's too inexact to use. Um, but what do you mean when you refer to these right-wing populists? And whether you can, as it were, be in a country with them where they would win, because your definition of right-wing populists would appear to, for instance, take in the majority of my country. Uh, you said you had no problem with conservatives, which one might dispute. But, but what would you do once you had de described your opponents as right-wing populists? Uh, uh, Try to make a, a, a binary in which you stand on the good side and the evil right-wing populists stand on the bad side. What would you do on those occasions when they are on to something? When, for instance, a sovereignty question is serious or a migration question is serious? How can you interact with them, having demonized them to the extent that you wish to do? Palavia, do I you just feel that you're say, demonizing no, populists? not at all. I just said, and maybe you didn't hear it, Douglas, but I said in a democracy, the majority wins. And I'm very well aware that this is the rules. So by actually throwing myself into these battles, which I did on the very grounds uh, of a democratic interaction, um, and I, you know, worked with my own hands, I actually, uh, you know, accept that game and I, I try to find the better arguments, the more convincing language, uh, and I did. But and so I to your question, to how I define yes. writing populists, I, of course, would say um, that writing populists to me is people who claim for themselves that only they represent the true will of the people. And I can tell you in Switzerland, we had elections where the writing populists, the Swiss People's Party, had ads where it was written on real Swiss vote for the SVP, where I would say, well, I'm Swiss too, and I would never vote for your party. Just Look, one last point, I mm. mean, about Brexit and Brexiteers. I would say, Douglas, and maybe I'm very provocative about it, but um, I want to challenge that everyone who voted for Brexit voted for Brexit for the very same reasons that you did. I don't think you can speak for all the Brits uh, that yeah, oh. you would call the majority. I don't, I don't claim to. I simply refer to the opinion polls that prove what I just said, wow. which is that sovereignty was the fundamental issue that united the British people uh, on, on the 2016 Brexit vote and that it shouldn't be dismissed, it should be understood. There is always a remarkable thing in political science that people uh, are the thing that they accuse other people of. Um, I've heard tonight nothing but an endless set of claims about what Europeans should be, and they all seem to have to be like Flavia, otherwise they are right-wing populists. This okay. claim that this is exactly today. what the right-wing populists do is precisely what you have spent the evening doing yourself, yeah. okay. which is to say anyone who doesn't agree with me is not in touch with the deep people of Europe. Good. Uh, I, I don't think that's a reasonable way to go forward. Just clarify that I came Last here point, invited. Flavia, and then yeah. we go to the audience. I was invited here for a debate, and as mm. much as I know about debates is that each of the uh, debaters prepares a speech. I did it. You didn't. I was expecting Sorry. your view to be presented this mm. way, so I prepared myself this way. So I'm still hoping well, uh, I can hear more. Um, yeah. To hear in order to. If this is, by the way, um, uh, to be the last round, I would just uh, mention something very quickly. 
Um, uh, Flavia said uh, that I haven't prepared a speech. I do indeed have a speech here. I haven't been called upon to, to, uh, to use it tonight, um, but uh, uh, my notes sit in front of me. I don't quite know yet again why that attack should be made. And I would just add one other thing, uh, which is that it is my experience that I turn up to events uh, and uh, broadcast in when quarantining rules do not allow me to turn up to events in a spirit of genuine openness to ideas. It's one of the great founding in liberal ideas that we engage with each other. And I would just make this one point. When Flavia stood up and described me as stupid or a fool, she said, and then talked about uh, arguments I make as boring, uh, elitist, I've rather lost count of the number of insults she did, that is to not engage in that fundamental liberal spirit of debate. And so I'm very sorry myself that her decision to open this evening by being rude should have meant that some certain curtness might have been needed in reply. But I would hope on other occasions that she would join me in the spirit of genuine liberal thinking. Now, guys, I've discussed the principle of hitting as hard as you get hit on this channel before. If you're ever in a boxing sparring match and you're fighting someone who's far lower skill level than you, and if they run at you from the jump with a haymaker loaded up from their hip, then they're fair game. And if the attitude is particularly bad, then it is your responsibility to teach them a bit of a lesson. And that ego death is a rite of passage for anybody who enters the ring. We all have our humbling moments, and that's what young Flavia has just experienced here. And we can only hope that she rethinks things after this. But this is exactly how these debates and these ideas should be approached. A rhetorical ninja sensei like Douglas Murray approaches his battles with a temperance and a stoic restraint, such is the way of a wise elder. But when he is provoked, but when he is provoked, his opponents will feel his wrath and will be treated with the correct and appropriate amount of mockery and ridicule. See Flavia here, she may be pretty and speaking with a gentle and soft voice in a lovely Swiss accent and appealing to hope and caring for everybody, but make no mistake, she is a wolf in sheep's clothing, and her rhetoric tells the story. She demonizes the majority of the population as right-wing populists and calls them backwards fools while painting herself as some arbiter of moral good because all she wants to do is take a night train to Lisbon and eat oranges for breakfast in her pajamas. That's it for me today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to join the Rattlesnake TV community, then hit that link in the top of the comments or in the bio where you can come to rattlesnaketv.locals.com and support the channel. And also, if you want to hit me up on social media, that's also in the link trees. If you want to watch another video, click right here. And if you want to subscribe to the channel, if you haven't already, click right here. Till next time, I'm Jake. This is Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous.